Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today's installation of the HUD Distress Cities webinar series. Uh, as you can see, today's session will cover COVID-19 recovery strategies for small business districts. Before we get started, we just wanted to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everybody is currently muted and will remain muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions or want to submit any chats or questions or comments, you can use the chat and Q&A functions. Uh, please, if you can, use the chat box to submit any technical issues that you're experiencing and use the Q&A to submit any questions that you have for the panel. Um, we'll hold all questions until a 30-minute Q&A session, but in, you feel free to submit your Q&As throughout the presentation, um, and we'll just hold those for that, for that um, Q&A session at the end. We will also be doing some live polls throughout the webinar, so please be ready to answer those as we open them up. We'll keep them open for about a minute, so just be, um, be on the lookout for those. And lastly, we wanted to let you know that we will make the recording and all of the materials that you see today available after the webinar on the HUD Exchange website. Um, and we'll let you know when those are available. Today, we're going to be hearing from three presenters. We're going to hear from Liz Demetrio, who is a program director with LIST Economic Development Team. We're also going to be hearing from Larissa Ortiz, who is a managing director of research and analysis at StreetSense. And lastly, we'll be hearing from Laura Ostry, a senior research strategist in the research and analysis team. Um, with that, I'll pass things over to Liz to get us started. Thank you, and welcome everybody to COVID-19 Recovery Strategies for Business Districts. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Dimitriou with the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. And LISC is the country's largest community development corporation that has 36 field offices and a robust rural program. Um, through our partners and through our staff, we support communities in every state in the nation. We have a comprehensive approach to community development, um, which equips underserved communities with the capital strategy and know-how to grow inclusive economies. We support businesses directly through grants and loans while investing in the development of strong local ecosystems that enable them to succeed. So COVID-19 uh, took us all by surprise. I'm actually remote right now in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, very different from my hometown of Brooklyn. We're all facing different challenges. We're all remote from different locations. Um, and all of our cross-sector partners had to quickly adapt to a new way of engaging with and supporting businesses on top of other issues that their cities and towns uh, were facing. Some had to cancel events and other gener revenue generating activities that supported their operations. And so we saw a lot of people uh, asking the same information and really looking for a framework, really looking for some advice uh, in an uncertain time. And as a result, we partnered with StreetSense, uh, who's a long-term partner of LISC. We've worked on lots of things together to create the Commercial District Recovery Guide. Uh, the guide provides a framework for action to support COVID-19 recovery efforts in downtowns and commercial districts. It also provides resources, best practices, and case studies. And while we understand that every community is different and the challenge that you all face is unique, uh, we hope that the guide and today's conversation will help you move through each phase of recovery. Now, what do I mean by each phase of recovery? Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Larissa and Noor, who will walk us through each of those phases. It's important to think of recovery in phases because we're not going to be in the same place forever. And so we need to start thinking about what the next phase will look like and how we're going to keep some of our energy um, into, into planning um, and not just in, you know, worrying about what's in front of us um, at the moment. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Larissa and Noor, who will go over the phases and then we'll talk about today's agenda and then lead today's conversation. Hi, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for uh, to HUD um, and to LISC for um, asking us to participate. This is a really important issue. Um, our, our focus is on, on retail, uh, downtown business districts and, and environments where mostly dominated by small businesses. And when this happened, you know, we recognized we needed to think uh, differently about how you, how you recover. Um, and we quickly, you know, went about trying to look at what disaster recovery um, literature had to tell us about recovering and addressing emergency management. And one of the first places we went was the um, International Economic Development um, Council, which had a great publication, which offered a framework for emergency management. And I 
If you haven't looked up Leadership in Times of Crisis, I would suggest um, that as a resource um, to check out. Um, the, it's available for free download. But, you know, that was really useful for us because we recognized that, um, you know, what our recommendations were early on um, in the crisis um, during response, during closure, um, would be quite different than what they are during recovery. And now I think we're really in the recovery phase, and today, um, although the, the, the uh, publication focuses on all three phases. Today, we're really going to focus on, um, you know, a little re response, mostly recovery, um, and recognizing that we're going to have to plan and prepare for a new normal, um, and that's coming. Um, so um, today, we'll be talking about four things. First, I want to talk about some of the bigger trends that you all likely are facing. Um, and how that impacts your work at the local level. And then I'll pass it over to Noor to walk through some of the tactical um, insights and recommendations we include in the guide. Um, speaking to the issue of the impact of COVID-19 on, on businesses, we went into this um, recognizing that businesses are fragile um, even before the pandemic. Um, small business cash flow is always a challenge. And, um, you know, pre-pandemic, 50% of small businesses had a cash flow reserve of 27 days. Um, we had some communities whose closures um, lasted much longer than that. Um, so, you know, our question was, how are these businesses going to survive um, at all they're, if, if they're destroyed entirely? There's no recovery from that. And, and so, you know, a lot of the um, federal resources went to lengthening that time and that buffer, um, which allowed many businesses to remain open and viable um, for recovery. Um, and this really affected small businesses, um, minority-owned businesses, who were actually twice as likely to have, you know, less cash on hand and, would, and are more at risk. Um, so we want to take a quick poll of those of you um, listening, um, if you could take a moment to respond to the following question. Um, what percentage of businesses on your Main Street or in your commercial district have closed temporarily as a result of COVID-19? 20% um, or fewer, um, 21 to 30%, 31 to 40%, 41 to 50%, more than 50% um, or not sure. And we're gonna give you um, about 40 seconds to respond. Um, and, and one of the things is, as you respond, you know, that we want to share is that every community is going to see, you know, a very different set of impacts. Um, if you are a business district with a lot of essential businesses, perhaps you fared a little better. Um, those are uh, retail categories where people have continued to spend, grocery stores, pharmacies. Um, but, you know, discretionary spending has plummeted. Um, so, you know, and, and those were non-essential businesses. So if your district have more of that or your uh, main streets, um, you may see a higher rate of closure. Yeah, I would just add that depending on where you are, some um, business districts and some business types aren't even allowed to reopen. Um, so I think depending on where you are, that's sort of an added layer of nuance. So while we wait for your feedback, um, you know, we've heard everything from, um, you know, 25% of all businesses are going to close to 75% of businesses. And actually, a recent Yelp report um, suggested that 60% of all restaurant closures are, are permanent. So, um, you know, most folks um, said uh, more than 50% or they weren't sure, actually. And I think, you know, that might speak to some of the challenges with collecting data or even knowing what's a permanent closure versus a temporary closure. Um, thank you for that. So, you know, we recognize that um, minority-owned businesses were particularly affected and, and businesses that um, serve underserved communities. 90% um, of small businesses of color were excluded from the Paytech Protection Program, the PPP program. Um, and we knew that they were already very fragile going into this. So, you know, that's a particular challenge um, in many of the communities we serve. And so we're curious as to what percentage of businesses in your community do you estimate to be women or minority-owned? 25% um, fewer, 
um, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%, uh, 76 to 100% or, or not sure. Um, Elizabeth, what's been your experience with the with lending to um, you know this particular category of business? Yeah, so I think that you know one of the issues is the level of acceptance rates for minority and women-owned business loans, and so I think that adds another, an added layer onto things because businesses may not have the cash reserves that they might need to weather the storm. You know, the other thing is, at least in, in some of the communities where LISC works, a lot of minority businesses are located within minority communities, uh, LMI communities, and a lot of those communities, you know, are experiencing the loss of income um, that you had mentioned earlier, making discretionary spending even more difficult. And so you have the difficulty in accessing a loan, the, you know, less cash reserves, and then depending on your location, um, it might make it more difficult for you to reach customers. Mm -hmm. So um, not surprising, there's a, you know, good chunk of you who indicated, you know, 25% or fewer, 20, you know, less than 50%, let's say, um, and uh, most aren't sure, um, which is not, not uncommon either. Um, you know, we, we do want to say that um, this pandemic is occurring in what was already a um, really significant moment of transition for retail to begin with. We knew that e-commerce and online spending was growing. And what's happened is that we really accelerated that trend. Um, you know, folks, uh, we saw a 25% increase in e-commerce activity um, during the pandemic and a significant increase in curbside and um, and the BOPIS is, is buy online, purchase in store, if you haven't heard that, but 62% increase. Um, and, you know, most respond, you know, when you ask Main Street businesses, most don't have on -sale sales online sales capability. About 63% do not. Um, and so we know that moving forward, we're going to have to address these problems for our businesses to remain competitive. And part of what's going to make them competitive is meeting that increased health and safety expectation of consumers right now. And, you know, when we ask consumers what's most important to them, uh, they want to see businesses that have masks and physical barriers. They want to see cleaning and sanitation. Um, and that's going to help, you know, if we help our businesses address these issues, we've overcome some of the hurdles um, associated with getting consumers back into their stores. So as we think about what this means for local governments and, and small communities, um, you know, we want to take a look at sort of who was in the audience today um, in order to answer that question. And, and we, we, your responses, thank you for re responding to the pre-session questionnaire, um, really show that we are talking about a wide range of, of communities. Um, you know, many of you have a, a significant share of essential services on Main Street. Um, you know, you've indicated your average share is about 50%. Median size of, um, of participants on this call uh, or your cities is 45,000. A huge range of organizational budgets and, and um, in part because we know we're dealing with small organizations and, and large um, government entities. And the top geographies we're looking at are Pennsylvania, South Carolina and Florida, uh, California, where we have seen increases in, um, you know, some of the, uh, the virus impacts. Um, so as place-based organizations, as, as cities and municipalities, um, especially in small communities, you know, you are really critical partners in emergency management. You are the first place where that many of your businesses go for resources and technical assistance. And um, we know you have unique challenges. Um, we know that pre-COVID, these were challenges. Um, you know, you have uh, customers, consumers um, with lower spending um, power, 86% uh, um, of persistent poverty counties. Um, uh, we have po higher poverty rates, um, more so than 1990, 2000, or, or 2010. These are all rural communities. Um, we know that there's limited access to capital in many rural communities, um, and we've seen a decline in bank branches as, as um, 
you know, the as we've seen banks consolidate and close many of their um, local bank branches. Um, and we know that um, there's a labor pool shortage. So um, nearly one in five rural residents are 65 or older. They're not of working age. Um, and so these are all challenges we, we know you face. But, you know, the, the flip side is that um, with limited resources and capacity um, comes the potential to stay nimble, to be responsive, and to work creatively. Um, you know, we've worked in large cities, we've worked in small communities, and oftentimes, um, you know, smaller communities, it's easier to get things done. It's easier to turn things around. There, there are sort of fewer obstacles in your way. So we see that as an opportunity and a real uh, testing ground for a lot of the um, recommendations included in the guide. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Nora Ostry, who's going to walk through the response and recovery strategies. Larissa, and thank you everyone again for sharing your time with us and joining this discussion today. We're really excited to hear from all of you as well um, as we walk through some of these strategies. And um, if you have any questions, just a reminder, as Sarah mentioned earlier, to send your questions through the chat function so that we can help address some of these later on in the Q&A session. So I want to jump right in and begin to share some of the key strategies that I'm sure everyone's um, been waiting to, to hear that we've seen being implemented in a, a variety of communities and commercial districts across the country in recent months. And I'll quickly take us through some of the strategies in the response space before we dive into recovery with the understanding that many of you may have already gone through some of these early actions in response. But for others who may be starting to deal with maybe perhaps a second wave, some of these strategies in the response space might still be really relevant to you now more than ever. So um, with that, we'll, we'll sort of jump right into to the first um, few strategies in outreach. Um, as with managing any disaster event, um, first and most important response is always to reach out to your neighbors and your stakeholders. So in the case of commercial districts, this includes everyone from your business owners, property owners, and your customers. So stakeholder outreach and engagement is, has been just so important during the pandemic because of the deluge of information and resources that have been made available at such a quick and rapid pace. Um, one of the main goals of outreach and engagement for a lot of economic development leaders during the pandemic has really been to act as a conduit for accurate and up-to-date information. So. It's not just one thing to be able to share, um, you know, accurate information from the federal level, from state, and from city level. Um, it's also making sure that you're sharing up-to-date information because things are constantly changing day by day. Um, small business owners in particular want to know what's most applicable to them. So a lot of the times in this case, um, less is really more. So your role in, in outreach and engagement is also to be sort of a curator of information and and coordinating resources to, to your stakeholders. A really quick checklist of items here that your organization should really um, already have or continue to consider in your outreach and engagement efforts with your stakeholders. Um, really start with things as simple as establishing a business or stakeholder contact list. You'll be surprised in, in a lot of communities around the country that you know, in, in regular day-to-day -day activities, you may know someone that lives next door that has a business next door, but not have a contact information of the owner of the business or the property owner um, next door. And so really the first and most important step is really establishing a contact list by which you can start to disseminate, you know, all of the information um, at the municipal level or even at the county and state levels. And in smaller communities like yours, this might be a lot easier to do when um, the total number of stakeholders or businesses on your main street is a little smaller, um, when social networks are smaller and connections are more easily made. Um, so that's a great thing to do. Uh, another really important piece of outreach is also outreach to local and regional media outlets so that you can share your district story as things start to change on the ground. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. Um, one important thing here once you've established your, your contact list is really identifying um, an accessible platform or tool to communicate constantly with your stakeholders, especially amidst the pandemic where things are constantly changing day, changing day by day. You want to be able to make sure that 
you have somewhere to go, all your stakeholders are able to get information directly from you or for them to reach out to you really easily and share what their challenges and opportunities are. And we've seen a ton of different uh, digital platforms and applications that different communities of different sizes have started to use. Some of these may be familiar to you, some might not. Um, these really vary across uh, regions and the um, the kinds of stakeholders that you have as well uh, really does impact which platform you might choose to use. Um, we've seen Facebook be a really popular one with smaller communities, especially using the private group uh, function, and we'll share an example in a moment. Um, in communities in, in Puerto Rico, for example, where we're working, uh, WhatsApp has been a really popular way to get in, in touch with stakeholders on the ground. Business owners are um, more comfortable with sending text messages or really quick messages to um, their be uh, business leaders, um, and so WhatsApp has been a really popular tool there as well. So depending on, on the kinds of stakeholders that you're dealing with, the size of um, members um, in your community, uh, those are all things to consider when sort of choosing that accessible platform or tool to use. And then, of course, making sure that if you're in a community where maybe perhaps English isn't the first language that uh, business owners or property owners speak, uh, making sure that language accessibility is something else that you consider as well. So I mentioned Facebook uh, has been a really popular one for smaller communities. Um, in Wisconsin here, uh, this downtown organization uh, has really been quick to respond and set up a Facebook private group um, as a resource center for downtown businesses during the pandemic. Um, I think we have a little less than 200 members on there, um, and group membership can be exclusive to, to Facebook groups, so you can make sure that you're sort of monitoring who's involved in the conversation, um, who's sharing the information. You always want to make sure that the accurate pieces of information are being shared through the platforms. So, so this is one really great example. In Frisco, Texas, and I know there are a number of you um, on the call or on the webinar today that are from the region as well, um, Frisco Downtown Merchants Association was really quick to use Zoom. Um, you know, we've all become really familiar with the application as a way to sit in set, uh, webinars and listen in on, on experts um, sharing resources and information, but it can also be used for just interaction between yourself and your stakeholders. And so the Merchants Association here in Frisco um, decided to set up daily Zoom calls with each other so that everyone can sort of share their issues that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day during the pandemic and share resources really quickly as well. So that's a really creative way um, to use the digital applications and resources that you have at hand for your, for your own group of stakeholders. Um, really quickly, we want to just find out from you, um, how many of you have been involved in, in um, outreach to your stakeholders, if you're using certain platforms, are you still reaching out in person, if that's safe to do so in, in whichever region you're located, or are you reaching out by phone, um, perhaps maybe because uh, digital connectivity just might be an issue in your area, um, or are you choosing one of those online platforms that we just spoke about? We're really curious to see how many of you have um, taken these different routes to engage with your stakeholders during this, this crisis and just being in touch with them throughout the pandemic. Liz, with um, some of your list communities, uh, have you seen any other sort of unique ways that uh, stakeholders are, you know, reaching out to each other and staying engaged with each, with each other through the pandemic? Perhaps maybe even your own community in Brooklyn, are they, are they using something unique to, to stay in touch? Yeah, I mean, I think that even, you know, like social platforms like Facebook, um, there is a group of practitioners in New York City that all work in different business districts that started a group just talking about, you know, COVID recovery and sharing resources, sharing information on what their businesses were facing. And I think the most beneficial was when certain areas were, were opening for outdoor seating and were able to share how they were, how they successfully, uh, you know, moved into the street or took over parking spaces and some did the, some, some were earlier to adopt than others. And so they all got to kind of learn from each other. <laughs> It looks like through the polls as well, a lot of um, folks on the call in the webinar today are already using online tools to, to engage with each other. So that's really great to hear. And if 
if you have um, a different application or platform that you're using that's maybe not Facebook or the ones that we mentioned earlier, please feel free to share them in the chat because I'm sure um, some other uh, communities might be interested in, in using some of those as well. Um, another part, key part of outreach and engagement uh, during the pandemic has been to coordinate resources and information and, and tracking um, with other leaders in the area. If you're a smaller community, um, you might want to reach out to the larger um, overarching body or organization that oversees um, regulations in your area to make sure that everything's sort of aligned. So going straight to your federal, state, county resources, finding out um, the available grants, and technical assistance that's available to businesses is really key. Um, and then, of course, with safety and hygiene guidelines, you want to make sure that that's coming from the right um, resource, health resources um, in your jurisdictions as well. We've also found trade association uh, resources and guides to be really helpful. I know there's not a sign to um, managing emergency at this point during the pandemic other than, you know, obviously your safety and hygiene guidelines. Um, and so a lot of association bodies, um, industry leaders in, you know, restaurants or in uh, barbers and professional beauty associations, they're sort of thinking through on their feet about how their members are coping and pivoting during this period. And so trade association resources and guides that have come out in recent months um, and that are constantly being updated as well, I might add, um, are really good places to, to take a look at um, and share with your stakeholders as well. And then finally, with outreach, I mentioned earlier another key thing. It's not just, you know, about outreach to your business owners or property owners. It's also about outreach to local media outlets, especially as things, uh, things start to change or uh, your districts start to reopen. Uh, you want to make sure that the right story is being communicated through the media uh, to your uh, customers as well. So some examples early on in the pandemic, um, as uh, some areas start to, to reopen in Florida or in North Carolina, they really were quick to make sure that, you know, the media was covering reopening, making sure that as restaurants reopen that, you know, they're being marketed through local media outlets as well. So this is a really important piece. Um, so, you know, establishing information with local media outlets is another thing to be uh, mindful of. And so beyond outreach, um, in the response phase, really um, is data collection uh, and an important piece of that. And I'm sure a lot of you have been engaged with this, and we'll find out a little bit more from you. Um, how many of you have been doing this? Um, accurately and continually assessing your on-the-ground uh, conditions in your commercial districts and on your main street, which is really important as you start to tailor some of your recovery programs or your grants and technical assistance programs based on reliable information and data. And this is this is really important, not just during the pandemic, but in other disaster um, events as well. The first thing is a small organization. You might want to start building partnerships with overarching bodies um, to conduct surveys and assess the changes in your district. Uh, when we when we talk when we talk about surveys, Google Forms is you know really your go to um, free survey tool that's available for you to use, uh, especially with smaller groups. Um, we want to make sure that you're keeping the survey short. Uh, less than 10 minutes is really the ideal amount of time that a business owner might want to spend on in completing a survey. Um, and translating that survey across common languages in your community, like we mentioned earlier, um, if your community has stakeholders whose first language may not be English, you want to make sure that the surveys are accessible to them um, and so that they're involved in that conversation, that they're able to share with you um, the challenges that they're facing. And then, of course, we want to make sure that you're asking the right questions in the survey and that you're tracking the right kinds of information, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. So you want to be able to track and monitor everything from basic details of uh, types of businesses in your districts to their locations, how long they've been there, um, and their status with property. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of businesses, as Larissa mentioned earlier, struggle to to meet rent. Um, a lot of rent, rental assistance programs have been set up as a result, uh, but they're all they had to be 
uh, set up based on accurate data and information, and that's often tracked through surveys with business stakeholders. So you want to know uh, what percentage of businesses on your main street or your commercial district is currently uh, leasing space, the size of, of these spaces that they're leasing. These are sort of the basic details that you want to have and um, consider uh, as you start to tailor assistance programs um, if you don't already have them collected. Business finances and operations is another uh, bucket of information that you want to be able to track and monitor throughout the pandemic. Um, current status of business has been one, uh, and adaptations in business model. Um, we mentioned earlier that consumer preferences are starting to change. People want to buy online or buy online and then pick up in store. Um, and so we want to know how your businesses are pivoting during this period and how we might be able to support them as they pivot uh, further through the pandemic. Workforce uh, in smaller communities where this might be a real struggle of getting people back uh, working in, in service areas like restaurants, uh, we want to find out really what was the impact on workforce uh, early on in the phases of, um, of the pandemic and then later on as well as uh, districts start to reopen and how you might be able to support that for your local businesses. And then finally, not to forget your customers themselves. You want to know what they're feeling, what their perception and preferences are um, as we move through the pandemic, as we start to reopen some of the districts. So the big question here today is how many um, participants here have actually been engaged in data collection. We want to know from you how far in, um, if, you, if you have been collecting information and data, um, and of course, if there are certain types of metrics that you are tracking that we might not have mentioned earlier, um, please feel free to share them in the chat as well. I'm sure everyone else on the call um, would love to hear from everyone else about what they're tracking, what they're monitoring throughout the pandemic. We've seen a lot of different uh, ways that communities have been collecting this information. So I mentioned Google Forms is one way to do that. There are a lot of other survey, online survey tools that are useful. And then also being sure that um, if your district does have a lot of uh, an older demographic uh, of business owners, that maybe the digital tool might not be as applicable or relevant to that area or more difficult to get responses on. Um, we've also seen door-to-door -door surveys being conducted wherever that's safe to do. And then, of course, by phone, if you have your survey tool ready and someone can just call and run through the questions with the business owners on a, a quick call of maybe five to ten minutes, um, that's another way to make it accessible to maybe an older demographic of stakeholders as well. And the polls have sort of come in. Um, a lot of uh, participants are not yet um, engaging in da uh, data collection, so that's really important for us to know as we uh, think through also, you know, the follow-up sessions, um, what might be uh, interesting and relevant to participants here on the call. Um, data collection is a really big piece, especially as we think about uh, accessing further resources, uh, being able to track and report that to perhaps the federal or state government. Um, data collection is a really important piece of this. So we'll get to the meat of recovery really quickly here. Um, there's a lot to talk about, and I'm sure a lot of you are already doing some of these, and we'll, we're happy to hear from you through the chat as well um, if you've engaged in some of these recovery strategies and if there's challenges that you've been met with that we might be able to help answer or solve here today during the Q&A, so feel free to send that through the chat as well. When we talk about implementation in the recovery phase of the pandemic, the physical environment is a really big piece. That's the first thing that the customer sort of engages with a faces with in your district. So cleanliness and sanitization of your district is really important. The public realm, the first, uh, the sidewalk experience and the streets are really, have really played a huge role during the pandemic, especially as districts try to maintain social distancing guidelines. So we'll talk about some of those strategies uh, today. And then of course, as we think about long-term um, making sure that retail sales uh, continue uh, through the pandemic and afterward. How can we support businesses, um, make sure that they stay in business and continue to make the sales that they need to make to stay open. Um, and then, of course, uh, pivoting and providing capital assistance to some of these businesses to adapt their commercial spaces as things change moving forward. 
Um, first thing we want to talk about here is cleanliness and sanitization, of course. Um, a recent sentiment study actually found that consumers are reporting the number one criteria for choosing a restaurant or dining establishment is really safety and sanitation. So things like quality of food has actually taken a step back now, um, and cleanliness and sanitization has come up front. So instead of doing all of that in the back end or behind the scenes, we're our team here at Street Sense has really been advocating for making the cleaning protocols much more evident to guests. So we call this the sanitation theater, um, making a huge show of, how, of the ways that in which you are cleaning your businesses or your public realm in your districts. That's uh, become a really important piece of recovery as well. So putting signs up when you're cleaning certain areas or when you were last, you had last cleaned that area, making sure that you're providing all of the resources that is needed to clean uh, businesses as well as public realm. Um, these are all things uh, that are important as part of recovery. And then of course, educating businesses on all of the very rapidly changing guidelines from your Department of Health locally or from the CDC and FDA um, around workplace health and safety. Um, making sure that some of these resources are really quickly available to the businesses on one of the platforms uh, that you're using to communicate and engage with stakeholders, uh, making sure that they're updated constantly, um, and making sure that you're, wa you're sort of watering it down and curating that information to what's most relevant to your businesses. Not every piece of information in the guideline might be applicable to your businesses in the main street, so making sure that you're curating that information as well. And of course, providing, um, in some cases, we've seen communities provide uh, small amounts of PPE, whether it's you know the gloves or uh, the masks to staff at, at local businesses um, and temperature taking equipment as well. Um, and then of course, where best possible, finding ways to limit um, interaction between service staff and, and customers by having self-service recycling and busing stations. We wanna be able to keep keep your um, employees in your districts safe as well. And the big piece here um, in recovery across the country so far has been you know, the way in which you adapt to your public realm. We really want to encourage social distancing um, and overcome um, the limited store occupancy restrictions that a lot of states have, in, uh, have already uh, implemented with some public realm act activations. And, and one way that a lot of communities are doing this is through outdoor seating and outdoor dining areas, whether on the sidewalks or over parking spaces, on street parking spaces. The town of Vienna in Virginia has done a really great job of this by actually using their existing um, uh, commercial permit uh, processes so they're not re-establishing or inventing a whole new wheel with permitting. They've just sort of adapted what they previously had in their community to be able to support outdoor dining in, in the town. So use your existing permit systems and protocols. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Something that's already worked in your town is a really great place to start. Um, and a lot of communities are also limiting the application fees and making it easier for businesses to adopt this. Um, a lot of small business owners in particular, you know, they're not just having to pay for application fees. A lot of the times they're also purchasing furniture, um, outdoor seats and tables. This just adds cost to the businesses um, and we want to be able to limit the hurdle and the obstacles for them. So limiting application fees has been uh, one way that a lot of communities are doing this and of course providing the clear instructions and a how-to guide on getting permitted well. We don't want um, a scenario in which small businesses are then being penalized for doing something that maybe might not be to the rule book. Uh, so we want to make sure that instructions are really clear, make them um, across available across different languages if that's something that your community needs as well. Other low cost and tactical strategies uh, that we've seen across uh, different communities, really expanding sidewalks, whether that's with uh, concrete bollards or um, very temporary uh, plastic cones. We've seen sort of a range of different materials being used for this. Um, assigning public plaza seating or public space seating to adjacent restaurants. That's really one way to activate your public realm. If you already have uh, an adjacent public space or a park or a plaza near some of your local businesses, 
encouraging really your customers to use uh, these public spaces to enjoy the products and services of nearby businesses is one way uh, to do that. And then, of course, uh, encouraging sort of a better flow and circulation of vehicles in your district. If your district is one that, you know, relies on uh, customers getting uh, getting their private vehicles, private vehicles, uh, dedicating zones for, you know, someone who might want to just do a curbside pickup is is really important. Um, if your area maybe perhaps has relies more on bicycles, making sure that bikes or e-bikes and um, micro mobility options are one way to to get to the district and easily parked near businesses as well. We've seen a lot of communities get really creative with social distancing, wayfinding, and signage, and this happens everywhere from your inside your stores to the sidewalks outside the stores and even in public spaces like parks um, and plazas. And they can range from everything from uh, stickers and decals on the floor, um, making sure that those are easy to remove as well uh, when, when needed, uh, all the way up to upright ball art signs and um, you know, painted stickers uh, on and paint uh, paint on the floor as well. We've seen in a lot of parks, um, and you've, I'm sure a lot of you have seen a picture of uh, Domino Park in Brooklyn, New York, where uh, you know they sort of created social distancing circles in in the park uh, to make sure that people are keeping their distance in the public space. So that's those are all the different ways in which you're directing the flow and movement of customers through your districts. And then, of course, announcing policies on, on sanitation and social distancing. Every now and then, we sort of forget, you know, the, the conditions and the environment in which we're in. Uh, we need a gentle nudge or reminder about staying six feet apart, about wearing a mask when we're at certain businesses. Um, these are all signs that we should continue to publish and to announce across uh, the public realm, but also in stores and making sure that you're providing that support for businesses as well or guiding them at least in creating some of these signage. When we think longer term, as we start to get into the colder months um, in the fall, you want to make sure that your businesses are, you know, sort of changing or adjusting their store operations, going digital in a lot of the cases is really important. So that might mean everything from uh, providing technical assistance or grants for businesses to set up uh, online store reservation systems or mobile pre-orders, which we've seen with a lot of um, restaurants and cafes uh, to contactless payment uh, equipment. So a lot of small businesses that are already using Square, for example, for, pay uh, for payment uh, systems can easily switch to contactless payment. Uh, these are all the getting digital tools that we want to be able to help and support our businesses uh, as we think long term into the colder months. Long term as well, we want to think about how we might be able to redesign storefronts to reduce sort of the touch points um, and areas in which we might be colliding with other customers within the storefronts. Um, I know a lot of businesses are putting up sneeze guards, um, plastic uh, guards between seating at bars, um, so, uh, some ways in which they were sort of redesigning the inside of their storefronts. Um, we want to make sure that all of these different store operational adjustments are supported by, by funding, uh, supported by technical assistance. Uh, some of the business owners, smaller business owners might not know how to go about uh, doing some of this work um, and making sure that professional assistance is ava available for some of these businesses as well. And then, of course, marketing efforts uh, is really important. It has been important throughout the pandemic in terms of businesses and commercial districts communicating about whether or not businesses are open, um, businesses have switched to online sales, um, or if they're having different promotions or new packages and types of products and services that they may, they may have adopted um, during the pandemic. And so marketing has been a really important tool for for businesses and commercial districts throughout this pandemic, and we want to make sure that that continues as well. So, you know, some commercial districts have gone as far as setting up a virtual pop-up market, which is what you see here on the left is Sunnyside Shines, 
um, in New York City, uh, having some local vendors uh, promote some of the work and products that they're offering through a Facebook Live event, for example, um, in other more uh, in other larger communities like a whole county of Fairfax, so they've sort of set up a takeout trail app on the phone in which local customers can go and see which businesses are open, if they're uh, selling things online, collect points that way in sort of a customer loyalty program. So there are a lot of ways to pivot your businesses online and to support marketing of businesses as things change during and after the pandemic. And so this is something we want to consider as well. Of all of the things that we've sort of run through really quickly in the last 15, 20 minutes, um, what have been the main obstacles, I guess, that you're facing um, or anticipate facing in implementing some of these strategies that we've discussed today? That might mean everything from lack of expertise um, at your government level or at your local organization to limited staff capacity, which is something that, you know, we're very cognizant of for small communities. Um, you know, you might be the finance uh, manager and the economic development director all in one, and so limited staff capacity might be one thing. Um, and then insufficient funding as well as another that, you know, might come up as a main obstacle. So we want to hear from you. Uh, what are some of the main challenges that you faced or anticipate facing in, in implementing some of the strategies that we've discussed? And of course, feel free to share um, any other obstacles. If you select other in the poll, um, share with us through the chat, and we want to be able to share them as well and talk through some of these perhaps uh, during question and answer. So it looks like the polling results will be coming in in a second. This has there been any, have any one of these options or challenges come up? Um, in, in the list communities that uh, you're working with um, more than others? Anyone more than others? Sure. I think that, you know, not everybody is well equipped to work remotely. And a lot of communities are also facing, you know, students at home, daycares closed. And I think that adds an additional challenge to local capacity. So I think the capacity issue, we've just seen that, you know, mm -hmm. the impact of that be, be very, 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 very huge. And I think I'm seeing that reflected right now, actually. Um, through the poll results, it looks like over 15% of you are reporting limited staff capacity as the main obstacle, and then, of course, insufficient funding as being the next big bucket of item there. So really interested to hear, uh, for those of you who have selected others through the chat, if you're you know, willing to share with us what that other um, reason or challenge might be um, that perhaps we might be able to discuss today on the Q&A. And with that, I think I'll hand it off to, to Larissa to take us through the bright spots um, for smaller communities. Hi, thank you, Noor. Um, so, you know, as we look ahead, you know, we recognize that it's challenging to do so. Um, you know, the guidelines around health and sanitation we were given three months ago are different than they are today. Um, you know, the ways in which, um, you know, the, the potential for closure again and going through a second wave, you know, is still sort of hanging over our heads. Um, you know, that, that said, um, you know, there are, we do see opportunities. We do know that um, there remains concern about being in interior spaces, um, and that includes enclosed spaces um, and enclosed malls, which historically have um, created a lot of competition and, and siphoned off customers from our Main Street environment. So, you know, if, if folks and more than a quarter of consumers are concerned about enclosed malls in the next six months, if, if, if that's the case, we have opportunities for Main Street environments, which are open air shopping environments and, and you know, the ability to support businesses by through street closures or outdoor dining. Um, is, is particularly uh, salient here. Um, also, we think for smaller communities, the remote work policies might actually be an opportunity to drive, um, you know, more residents to your communities, residents who previously um, could not have lived in rural places and small towns. They needed to be tethered to employment centers. Um, this pandemic has untethered so many people and created the opportunity to grow population 
and, and grow work from home, which in turn grows spending. Um, so we have, you know, we've seen demand um, is higher, um, higher than it was pre-pandemic uh, with people who are cross, moving cross country or looking, home, looking for homes outside of cities. And then, you know, a lot of communities do depend on tourism. We know that the hospitality industry has taken a huge hit. Um, but that there are opportunities to pivot and recognize that your residents and your, your domestic tourists are an opportunity. So as, you know, international and long haul um, carriers sort of struggle to, to really remain salient, um, and, and we know those, those sales have fallen significantly, um, these are opportunities to promote your town um, regionally, locally, um, pivot towards your outdoor recreational assets. Um, rural areas we know, um, you know, have a lot of opportunities in outdoor recreation often. Um, and incentivizing tourism assets to open um, and tourism supporting businesses to open to a different customer base. Um, so we think those are opportunities for, for rural communities. And, and now we want to open it up to um, discussion, Q&A, um, we have, you know, some questions, um, which I think Sarah was going to pose to us. We'll hope, uh, and please remember to use the chat um, for questions. We have um, a really great group of uh, folks on the team. Elizabeth is working, as she said, in, you know, 38 field offices around the country. There's almost nothing that between Elizabeth myself and Noor, we, we haven't seen in communities large and small. Um, so please um, feel free to ask questions and, and if there are any, you know, follow-up that we can do. Thanks, Larissa, and thanks, Liz and Noor, for that really great overview and for walking us through some of the strategies that you're seeing in, in helping uh, small businesses recover um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions already come in, but as Larissa noted, please feel free to keep submitting any questions or, or comments that you have via those, those chat and Q&A boxes. So to start us off, um, have you guys seen any examples of manufacturing businesses in small downtown commercial districts that have successfully shifted their operations to making, um, you know, new items to respond to the COVID pandemic, like personal protective equipment? Yeah, we yes. knew that the manufacturing question was going to come up. Elizabeth, you might have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, no. So, I mean, I've I've heard this um, from so many different people that, you know, manufacturers have shifted. I know in Brooklyn, where I live, our local distillery, Van Brunt Stillhouse, um, shifted to making hand sanitizer. And I actually own their hand sanitizer. I'm like a, a hipster sanitizer holder. Um, and then I got business in industry, industry city, which is like a larger industrial complex shifted to making, you know, masks. They were sort of high fashion, um, you know, designers. And so I think a lot of people, you know, saw the need, um, to, to think differently and to also, you know, help where they could by making PPE. But I think the next, the next sort of like phase is how to, how to scale that and how to make sure that we have, um, flexibility in place where our local manufacturers can, you know, produce that stuff in scale for the country, you know, mm -hmm. as we, as we change and as we need, um, you know, new items. I know a lot of those, you know, sort of uh, plexiglass dividers that some of the businesses are using, there's a lot of plastic companies, you know, that can, you know, retool to make those very easily. And so, you know, how do you, um, how do you leverage the, the resources that, you know, your local manufacturers have? I will say more generally, we absolutely have seen a pivot, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs recognizing they have to diversify their income streams, you know, not just towards manufacturing, but, um, you know, we've talked to restaurants that have begun selling the um, ingredients um, and serving as like mini grocery stores or packaging meal kits um, so that, um, you know, people could bring home all the ingredients um, that they used to use in, in preparing food and make make meals at home, um, you know, and those have been really interesting pivots. Um, you know, we'll say with these changes in, in uses, and, and manufacturing is one I think we should be very sensitive to, is oftentimes the underlying zoning um, restricts um, 
some of the pivots you may be talking about in, in business districts. So it prevents manufacturing um, from, you know, from, from being a use. And so that is maybe why in many business districts I, I haven't seen it happen to the degree you might expect, although I have seen other kinds of pivots. Yeah, and I'll just add that permitting and licensing um, processes also uh, need to change, um, become more flexible um, as some of these businesses make their pivots as well. Um, and like we mentioned with the outdoor seating permit process, you know, application fees were reduced just during the pandemic uh, period. Um, so that's maybe something uh, to consider as we think about regulatory uh, obstacles and challenges. Thanks, all. We also have a, a comment from Brandy in Delaware who, who mentioned that there are also several breweries um, like Dogfish Head in Delaware that have shifted to uh, making hand sanitizer as well, um, and some fabricators that are developing face shields and producing um, mask supply to local hospitals. Yeah. Uh, uh, we also and can I can I Sorry. add to that? Of you course. know, part of part of the job, uh, you know, I, I think is connecting some of these new manufacturers who may not be in our downtown environments with downtown operators, with cities who need to purchase, you know, so creating a marketplace of um, uh, then the ability to purchase from local manufacturers is, is part of what we could be doing. We also got a question about whether you guys have seen any strategies for filling recently vacant storefronts. Um, Nell's uh, market is considering a pop-up retail incubator program with free and reduced rent. Um, are, do you guys have any guidance for how to successfully implement those kinds of programs, um, including sure. you know, retail for food and beverage or other things like that? Yeah, I mean, this was something we, we were working on before the pandemic. Um, you know, we knew that retail demand for brick and mortar was softening, um, you know, and, and what we've seen has only accelerated that trend. So, you know, we do anticipate more vacancies. Um, you know, before the pandemic, we were looking at, you know, art um, and creative activity in storefronts. We were looking at um, pop-up uh, retail in storefronts. Um, those things, I think, you know, still remain, but we, we recognize that that spending power, I mean, we have high unemployment right now, has been reduced. So. Um, the likelihood that there's going to be a lot of economic activity in the short term um, in all the vacancies that we anticipate, it, it's, it's hard to see that. Um, one, one thing that we do know, this is what malls do all the time, is camouflage those vacancies. Um, you know, I, I was recently in a district where um, they put up a sign in the window, in a vacant window that was a wayfinding and a directional sign that pointed people to businesses um, and said, you know, how how far, how long it would take for you to get to those businesses. So, um, you know, I thought that was a really creative way to point people to businesses um, through the vacancy. Um, you know, and, and I think other kind of camouflage and art techniques um, might be the direction we have to go temporarily at least. Yeah, and, and I think also considering other commercial uses on the ground floor is another important thing that we'll need to think about is, uh, in order to fill some of the recently vacant storefronts. And we've been talking about this with several communities across the country about how as, as retail demand softens, we need to think about other kinds of commercial uses, whether it be um, office space on the on the ground floor with, with active users coming in and out. So, for example, um, you know, your medical offices or vets, um, child care services as other uh, uses for the ground floor storefronts. Um, and then another thing with difficulty with pop-up retail, I guess, during especially during the pandemic um, and following that is um, fitting all of these different small businesses within a confined space and making sure that you're keeping um, social distancing and keeping sanitation practices up to, up to speed. Um, that's another key challenge that you might need to consider because when we talked about pop-up retail before the pandemic, it might have been easy to do fitting all of these different businesses. That's a great idea, but um, doing that now following a pandemic might be a little different. Thanks, Nora. I think I think you know we received a few comments from people um, asking about or you know expressing concerns about 
the need to focus on not just how business re re businesses reopen, but how businesses can do things safely when there are a lot of concerns still around COVID-19. So I think taking into consideration some of those things is, is, is very important now more than ever. I also, uh, we also received a question uh, about how businesses can be flexible and, and prepare for what's basically a lot of unknowns regarding, you know, future lockdowns or spikes in, in COVID cases. Um, we have a comment from Alan who said, you know, we must be mindful that so there are still restrictions in place within each state as spikes in, co in COVID occur. So how do small rural businesses survive without adequate fi financial assistance? Yeah, um, I, th I think we're all challenged by this. I think we're going to see, um, we are going to see business closure. Um, you know, we're looking at um, things like retail hospice programs. Um, you know, I know people don't want to hear that, um, but it's, you know, unless we get, you know, a significant influx of, of federal money, um, we, uh, we're likely going to see that. Um, you know, that said, I think a lot of what we presented here holds, particularly on the operations side, you know, uh, we have to throw everything we can at these businesses so they can eat every potential, you know, dollar out of existing customers as, as humanly possible. Um, that means, um, you know, it's a mix of helping them get digital, uh, you know, get the digital resources and technology to be able to allow people to purchase easily from them to pick up outside, um, you know, again, buy online pickup um, in store or right outside store, um, you know, closing of, of streets, particularly for dining, which is what we've seen a lot of downtowns to allow and enable outdoor dining. Um, you know, there's not one solution here. Um, it's a whole series of solutions and there's absolutely no silver bullet for the ones that make it through the other side. Um, you know, some of it is going to be in operations. Some of it is in marketing. We've seen small businesses pivot, uh, put all their money in marketing um, to raise awareness that they're there, they're open, and they've done very well. Um, so, unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Um, the businesses that succeed are going to try a lot of things, um, and then we are going to have businesses that, that will not make it to the other side. And I don't say that, I don't say that cavalierly. I mean, you know, this is hard for all of us. Um, you know, so I just I want to preface that it was not a cavalier comment. We did get another question about um, whether you guys have seen any businesses shift revenue streams uh, to acclimate to the new climate. So, for example, shifting operations to be mostly online. Um, have there been any other good examples of, of these kinds of shifts that you guys have seen? Selling alcohol. Yeah, there's been <laughs> selling alcohol. That's true. There have been some fun things that we've we've seen. Um, you know, we we've done some work in, in Memphis and and um, you know connected with um, their local downtown organization and you know local chocolate shop that manufactures chocolate in, in downtown Memphis um, pivoted to like chocolate tastings to like sending things out and doing Instagram and, um, you know, Facebook live chocolate tastings, um, you know, connecting with customers in a completely different way and, you know, really embracing their relationships and building loyalty through online platforms is a, for me, uh, you know, really creative strategy and approach. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of salons and gyms shift their in-person services to at-home services with, um, you know, salons providing perhaps nail kits um, and tutorial um, guide sheets uh, being mailed out. Uh, gyms are renting equipment as well um, instead of, you know, uh, having people come in and work out. Um, and at-home spa sets are, are, you know, some of the things we're seeing, especially with the service businesses personal service businesses. Yeah, I've actually taken some yoga classes online and, you know, you have access through Zoom to teachers across the country that you may not have had before. And I think that that's going to stick even when 
you know, things reopen. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities for teachers who are located in, in smaller towns to um, access a larger customer base. Great. Um, it looks like we kind of just lost more our uh, but we'll, we'll see if we can get her back. Um, we have a, a few more questions. Um, you know, some, somebody had noted that not not all the communities that um, that may need some of the support are up to speed on using some of the digital tools. Um, and do you guys have any recommendations for for what they can kind of do to maybe get some additional guidance on how to shift operations or how to you know kind of use some of the digital tools that are being made available to them? I would always recommend going straight to the application or the platform's um, resource hub. For example, Facebook has already set up a whole slew of resources and guides around how to use Facebook for businesses. Google has also done the same with leveraging Google um, for local businesses. So I would go straight uh, uh, to the source, which is you know the application or platform that you're choosing to use or are thinking of using. For, for ways to use that. Even Instagram has um, set up their own guts and resources for businesses that do want to sell via Instagram. I mean, this we, we do also have to recognize, like, there's a generational divide. Um, we work in a lot of communities where, um, you know, older, near retirement business owners, um, you know, are uncomfortable with this technology. Um, this this epidemic is, is going to hurt them, you know, more. Um, than younger entrepreneurs who are open to embracing change. I mean, this is a, a pivotal, like, moment of creative destruction in a way that we're witnessing. Um, you know, oftentimes these are businesses that, you know, want to deal only in cash. Um, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to deal with credit cards. Um, those are all things that are going to make a business less resilient over time. So, you know, helping, even with the basics, you know, having them begin – to track their sales um, through, you know, online tools, you know, Foursquare, and being able to sell, um, uh, uh, just being able to sell and track sales digitally through, you know, a, a platform um, is a huge first step, and that's really traditional in a way technical assistance um, that's provided by, you know, um, you know, business centers across the country. So, you know, I, I think pivoting and, and pushing on that, recognizing that, you know, we are still going to have older um, businesses and, and folks who maybe won't embrace it. Um, Nora, I know you mentioned Facebook and some of the other companies that are providing some of these digital tools um, for small businesses to use. Do you guys have any other recommendations about, uh, for like free or low cost software um, that people can use to create, uh, to meet their business needs? So for example, creating a business contact list? I think the yeah, free I, and most available option is always using, you know, Google Docs or uh, Google uh, Excel spreadsheets. We've seen a lot of communities um, across the country that have just, you know, set up a Google spreadsheet and then made it available to all of their different stakeholders to even track which businesses are open which days and crowdsourcing that information. So I think uh, Google is a really great one that, you know, is easily accessible if you have a Gmail account and that it's free and available to everyone to use. And, and you can also, you know, make it private if you need to um, and password protect it. So, so it does have a lot of capabilities on there that is also free to use. Yeah, I mean, what, one thing we, we haven't talked about is, is, you know, basically the Google, um, Google Maps and claiming your business online and making sure your business is online. I think um, you know, we've, we, we've done work in, in communities where, you know, only 30% of local businesses um, claim their app. Um, and in a world where everyone is finding businesses um, online and in real time and, and on maps, uh, you're, you're basically invisible. Um, so, you know, one strategy is, A, determining how many of your businesses actually claim their, um, their business listings. And helping them do that, that is a very, very simple sort of first step um, and something that business owners, of uh, you know, across the spectrum, younger, older, 
um, uh, likely be comfortable with or have someone do on their behalf. And I think we've talked a lot about tech options, but I think, you know, walking down a business district, people are still a little bit uncomfortable. A lot of things are closed. So having really great signage and, you know, explaining to people what the procedures are, if there's a mask required, letting them know that you're adhering to safety guidelines, and then just being very clear about the hours that you're open and the services you're providing. And if you're in a more visitor or tourism related town, um, you know, what are the big destinations and making sure that people that manage those areas know that, you know, your business is open as well. I'm sure a lot of, you know, clients and customers um, want to know where they can get ice cream and where, you know, want to know where they can go to eat. And so creating some type of a system where that information is, is shared, um, I think would be also a very like low tech, more, you know, word of mouth kind of offering. I wanted to point out as well that we, we got a, a comment from Patricia that um, her organization was lucky enough to get some funds for loans uh, to provide small businesses uh, to cover some of their shortfalls in working capital, but um, she's having some trouble identifying takers for those for those loans. Um, the application is short. It can be emailed in. They made it uh, simple with six months deferred payment and zero interest. Um, I wonder if, if any of our, our panelists have any recommendations for how Patricia can reach some of those businesses that might benefit from those loans. Liz, this might be a question for you. Sorry, you've chopped up a little bit. Can you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll um, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay, um, so we have a comment from, uh, from one of our attendees who, who um, works for an organization that was lucky enough to secure some loans to provide uh, to small businesses to cover shortfalls in working capital, but they're having a hard time identifying businesses to, to take some of those loans. Um, so was wondering if you guys have any advice on how the organization can uh, try to identify some of those small businesses to, um, to receive some of those loans that they can provide. Sure. Um, so we at LISC, we've had a, we've had a couple of like local and national grant programs which, have, which we have administered um, differently depending on the place. But online, even just through SurveyMonkey and having businesses, you know, register that way um, provides a great opportunity to get uh, a lot of data and information, not just from the businesses that you select, but from every business that applies. Um, but I guess, I, so I, if I think I'm hearing your question correctly, you have businesses, oh, you're talking about loans, not grants. I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a step back. So what I would do is I would, I would go to the places where the businesses traditionally look for help. And I don't know if that's the business library. I don't know if there's a smaller local organization that goes, that people go to for help. I don't know if it's like a flyer with, you know, a number on it that you put in the local gas station. Um, but figuring out where businesses usually go for information, I think would be the first step. And if you're a smaller area and you have an outreach list, um, I would I would also do some cold calling, just calling businesses directly to see what, you know, what everybody's individual needs might be. And I'm seeing yeah. um, Patricia respond um, saying she's done personal outreach, but they're still not getting any takers. And I think maybe another piece to think about is just walking through interested applicants or, or people that you're meeting with through the process step by step. I think sometimes it's just um, a lot to think about, uh, especially during the pandemic where there are a million things that the business owners might be thinking about just getting from day to day. Um, and so adding another, you know, even if it's a simple application process, adding that to their plate might be something that seems overwhelming. Um, just offering a, a hand and saying, you know, we can help you fill this in completely. We'll walk you through. We'll just sit with you for however many minutes to, to get you through this. Um, do you have some time? And I think that might be another thing to think about. I think I'm the other. Uh, oh, go on, Elizabeth. I was going to say, it's hard for people to be thinking about loans right now, but they might need loans later. And so, you know, getting the ball rolling and letting people know what materials and what information they're going to need um, mm -hmm. so that they can get loan ready and start assembling that. I think a lot of businesses right now are in a place where they're trying to access PPP or they're looking for small business grants. And the thought of taking on more debt is very overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should recognize that um, we are also in a in a moment where we're trying a lot of things, 
um, you know, not every program, not every, um, you know, grant or loan program is going to, to hit the sweet spot of need, right? Um, and it's okay to try something and have it not work, you know, and if, you know, if, if you keep on hitting a wall with this, you know, my question is, can you repurpose those resources and pivot and try something else? Um, you know, there's no shame in that. Um, we are all trying our best to respond to something that's unprecedented. And if you need to think about a different tool, you know, maybe it's time you do that. Don't, don't think that you have to keep on going down the path if it doesn't seem to be working. Just we did, we, we received a, a chat as well from Joanne who, who was agreeing and, and mentioned that businesses might be hesitant right now to take a loan if they're not sure that they can pay it back in six months. So uh, grants might be a more attractive um, opportunity for some of those businesses. Yeah. Uh, we also have um, a broad question about, you know, some of the uh, resources that are being made available um, you know, federally and, and some of these private grant programs that are being um, launched. Just curious what you guys are seeing any creative ideas for how um, small businesses are using these new funding resources. Re repeat that? Um, we, we received a question about um, what some of the ideas are that people that small businesses are using um, some of the new funding that's being made available for. How they're using it. I'm sure. I mean, we've we've begun to see, um, you know, communities that have invested and offered grants to, um, you know, COVID interiors, you know, helping people um, uh, purchase PPE, helping people um, install, uh, you know, social distancing measures, um, technical assistance um, to help identify what those needs are, and then capital resources. Um, to enable uh, businesses to do it, you know. So, so it's like holding a business's hand through this process of of addressing the health and safety guidelines um, and some uh, limited resources to help them purchase the things that they need to purchase. Um, you know, that's that's been very interesting um, effort, and and that's actually something that had occurred in. With some work we were doing in in uh, in Queens, New York, with the Queens Economic Development Council. Thanks, Liz. And I, I've moved to the, the next audience chat that I think we wanted um, to cover. But you know, I think as we cover the slides, please feel free to continue to um, chat or send in your questions as they um, as you as they come to mind. Great. Um, you know, I, I would add if we're waiting for folks to, um, to ask questions, you know, one thing that I, I found so interesting um, was this concept of sanitation theater. Um, you know, when we first started seeing this, it was like recognizing that, you know, some of what we do is, is smoke and mirrors, right? There are, there are absolutely health um, and sanitation guidelines that have to be followed. Um, and then there's stuff that you do that, that is theater that's about building confidence, that's, you know, about communicating that, um, you know, you can enter this door because we are thinking about these things. And we have communities that are exploring, you know, certifications or grades for businesses that um, are meeting guidelines so that, you know, folks know that the purveyor is, is focused and following these guidelines, so creating stickers uh, for the window or decals, um, you know, there are business uh, communities that are exploring that or, you know, exploring marketing programs um, for, for very local businesses. Um, you know, the, the sort of ideas that are floating out there are, are almost endless and, and, you know, some of the um, organizations, the trade industry organizations we mentioned early on. Um, their job is to track these great ideas. Um, and so by industry sector, you know, if you are a restaurant, um, you can find out what your trade association is highlighting as, as good ideas, the things that people are trying, because we're such a, in such a moment of innovation for almost every industry sector out there. Um, you know, those are great resources. Thanks, 
Thanks, Marissa. And um, just to get another question, on the, the data collection front, are, is StreetSense collecting examples of surveys or applications um, in one database? And if so, are, are people able to send them to you if they have um, examples to contribute? Yeah, I mean, early on in the in the pandemic, we we were following sort of what every uh, state was doing um, for for loans and grant programs, and then you know that became obviously un, unwieldy. Um, but you know, for uh, not so not nationally anymore, um, but locally for some of our our some of our work is focused on um, survey work and sentiment, like understanding what consumer sentiment right now, you know, how comfortable are consumers in particular regions, because it varies by region, right, um, going out to stores, what are their issues and concerns so that we can devise strategies um, to respond to that. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, we're collecting this information. Yeah, and I'll say in the list commercial district recovery guide um, that, you know, that was published early on this year, um, there's an entire section here on you know, potential sample questions, and we got a lot of that out of um, some sample surveys that we were um, definitely looking through and sifting through and looking at some of the best practices and case studies. So happy to take um, your survey um, if you're willing to share that so that we can add that to, to our expertise as well. I would just notice if folks have a follow-up item that they do want to share, um, with our presenters, feel free to use the, the email address that's listed on some of the marketing materials that, that you receive at Stress Cities webinars um, at list.org email address. You know, feel free to send any follow-up items there, and we'll we'll pass those along. Looks like we have cleared out our chat and Q and A for now. If anybody has any, um, you know additional questions, please feel free to submit them. So actually, I do actually have a question for Larissa and Nora because it's been about one to two months now since we've um, published the, the recovery guide. Is there anything new that you're seeing or is there anything that you're hearing, um, you know, now that things might be, schools might, you know, stay closed through the fall or, um, you know, some, I know I just recently heard that Google wasn't sending, wasn't requiring employees to come back until the summer of 2021. Like how has new information shifted things? Yeah, I mean, one one issue that, that's come up um, increasingly um, since we issued the guide or the concerns, particularly for um, central business districts or places, you know, downtowns where we have major employment, um, you know, and if, if folks are not coming back, um, the implications for um, downtown retailers and, and Main Street retailers, if, you know, if office workers are their major um, customer base, you know, is, is a real concern for for us. Um, you know, and and recognizing that all of the physical interventions, all of the sanitation recommendations, um, don't matter if you don't have a customer. Um, so, you know, as we pivot ahead, we have to put the customer first and think, okay, if you know, if the office worker is not our customer anymore, or if we're not getting visitors. Who is our customer? How do we build that base? And they're a new customer for you. So it means you have a new marketing effort that you have to explore, um, you know, and that's where, you know, we, we didn't put that in the guide too much, um, you know, around around marketing, um, but that's, that's an important pivot if you have to introduce yourself to a whole new customer base. I don't know, Noor, if you have anything to add on that. No, I think um, I would just add that, you know, as a result of that, I think smaller uh, communities that are just outside of huge metropolitan areas are 
you know, need to start thinking about, like you mentioned earlier, um, digital connectivity and supporting perhaps some of this outflux, uh, outflux of, you know, residents or workers to other areas just outside of the metropolitan areas. So, you know, where, where there's one area that might suffer from that loss of customer, there are some other areas that might gain from that. And so being able to attract these um, customers that are moving around um, is something that perhaps we didn't really touch upon um, in the guide. I'm pleased to report that it looks like we might have actually been able to answer um, everyone's uh, questions and, and comments. So uh, with that, maybe we can invite people to, to respond to this final um, you know, request for, for uh, comments. And as folks know, this is the first of a, a you know two sessions that will be on the topic of economic development. The next one will be a deeper dive into some um, some uh, additional topics. So please use this opportunity to let us know what you'd like to see covered um, in the follow-up session based on what you're seeing in your in your community. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And as we get, I think, the, I'm sorry. I think we have a few resources that we also wanted to share. Um, one of the main things on this list actually is uh, Google's navigating your retail business through COVID-19. We talked a little bit about um, online platforms and tools that we should be going to to help businesses be more visible online and and Google's put together this really great resource that um, we should all take a look at um, that's just been published pretty recently. Thanks, Nora, and I'll toggle back to the, the um, possible session ideas for the next, for the next call um, as we close out. But I just wanted to say a big thank you again to all of these excellent uh, panelists. Um, and a reminder that we'll be making all of the materials that you saw today and the recording available after the webinar on the How to Change website. Um, and also to mention that this is another installation of a six-part webinar series. The next session, which will be the, the, the second deep dive into the housing, uh, the topic of housing will be on August 12th, and you can uh, register for that through the How to Change website. With that, I'll, I'll keep things open just so people can continue to share their chats um, about what they'd like to see. But um, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.